Saw Valley Way, Everard's Meadows, the Enderby Shield. Um, this site um, came up um, through uh, planning archaeology. Uh, it's really bread and butter archaeology that the University of Leicester Archaeological Services is involved with um, all the time in, um, in Leicestershire and surrounding counties, where we look at archaeology um, that's going to be impacted by development. And uh, in this case, it was a development by Everard's, the Brewers, uh, on the south side of uh, Foss Park. The work was undertaken in 2015, the excavations in 2015, and led by Roger Kipling for ULAS. It's a story of archaeology and experimental archaeology, my first foray into experimental archaeology. And it's a very clear example of how much our understanding of prehistory is so reliant on what has survived. What we find is, is very limited. So what has managed to survive for all those thousands of years. And, uh, and so our ideas are very constrained by that. Historic references, we use those as well, and they can also lead us astray. So here we go. Um, the site um, near uh, Enderby, hopefully you can see my mouse cursor there, to the southwest of Leicester. And here we go, just outside the city limits. Here's a close up of the actual uh, development area in red. This is Store Valley Way, for those of you um, who are from Leicester or Leicestershire and know it, with Foss Park here. Here's the River Saw. So it's a large area to the north of the police headquarters um, of undeveloped land. Uh, we've been uh, recording Iron Age sites in, in Enderby and other parts of Leicester and Leicestershire since the 1980s. Um, we know of a number of occupation sites within close proximity of the Enderby Shield site uh, to the west, southwest, southeast, um, and the evidence includes enclosures that enclose the areas, the, the living areas, the farmsteads, roundhouses, ditched boundaries that pass through the landscape and they parcel up their land with, and also some evidence of metalworking. There's also Romana British evidence, uh, which immediately follows the Iron Age. Um, the site lies almost adjacent to the line of the of the Roman road, the Foss Way, which many of you will know, one of a number of Roman roads um, which, uh, which part across England and Wales. Uh, metal detecting along the route close to the Grove, Grove Farm Triangle, that's at, at uh, Foss Park, has yielded brooches, coins and a copper alloy seal box lid and a buckle. So there's occupation around that's that, that's led to those um, finds having been lost rather than, with there being a, a density rather than just stray finds. Excavations at Enderby Park and Ride revealed six Roman burials, um, albeit in poor condition, uh, included two male and two and one female skeleton. So here is a um, a satellite image courtesy of Google Earth of the um, development uh, of the broad area. There is our development site. Here is the drainage, um, showing you it's all effectively draining north, draining into the saw, which then drains Leicester uh, to the Trent um, up at, uh, at Red Hill. So you can see that we are to the west of the River Saw, and we are below the River Sense, which has come in from the east, the Weston Brook, and the Thur Thurlaston Brook. So there's a, 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 um, a number of smaller streams and rivers coming into the saw here um, to the south of our site. The Lubbersthorpe Brook joins into the north. And there's um, mapped alluvium. So alluvium is a flood deposit um, that's dropped by rivers. And uh, you can still see it being dropped by rivers now. There are periods in the past when it seems to be dropped um, more uh, than other periods, probably periods of greater rainfall and also increased soil erosion due to ag agriculture and cultivation and the uh, deforestation of the area. So you can see that our site effectively sits on the very edge of the alluvium and that tells us that we are just on the edge of the floodplain. The alluvium tells us where the floodplain, are, floodplain is because that's where it gets dropped. And there are our sites that we know of from the historic environment record 
uh, the black lines show us um, the lines of ditches and pits and that sort of thing and the coloured shapes show us uh, broader outlines of where we know there is archaeology uh, and, and past settlement. So in a bit more detail uh, here is our um, here is our immediate area, here is Saw Valley Way, uh, here is the Narva Road, here is our site and here are other sites that we know of uh, in the vicinity. So up here you can see an enclosure with roundhouses in it. There we go and there's a plan of that and that was excavated in the early 1980s by the then Leicestershire Archaeological Unit and students from uh, the University of Leicester uh, under the direction of Patrick Clay. Um, and then we have another enclosure to the south here and that was excavated also by Leicestershire Archaeological Unit by uh, a team led by Jim Meek in 1991. And you can see here is the ditch of a roundhouse uh, with internal features. So this is the remains of an Iron Age building. And uh, we've got a nice plan uh, showing the uh, fairly substantial ditch around the outside and then a number of roundhouses on the inside. Uh, now this is probably two phase so that the two, two houses go together at any one time. So features have been infilled and then recut and shifted slightly. And then down to the, uh, to the south, here we have on the edge of the park and ride site, we've got a double ditch. So these grey features here, these are ditches, boundary ditches. And they would have been continuous, um, but we've only excavated uh, what we have. And there's a plan showing uh, the line of a ditch and then where we have excavated. And then here we've got later, these are Iron Age and date, and here we've got Roman burials actually cut into the fill of the infield Iron Age boundary. And uh, a little uh, two terminals there showing that actually people were moving into the inside of this double ditch. That's a little detail of that. Uh, a grave uh, laid into the top fill of the ditch probably several centuries after the ditch had fallen out of use. Here's our development area. You can see in here, you can see crop marks and that was why it was uh, flagged for uh, uh, investigation. You can see here some dark lines, a dark line here. Uh, and these are uh, these show that underneath the soil there is uh, infill of, of uh, archaeology and that's um, allowed crops to grow deeper over the infill, the silty infill holds moisture a bit better, perhaps a little bit more nutrient rich and then at the right time of year the, the crop will grow higher and it will cast a shadow and we get to see patterns of what's below. And there's the results of what we found in black overlain over that crop mark. Uh, over here we've got trenches, these would have been early stage of work to actually try and identify where the sites were and then we've got the area over here that was stripped um, of soils for us to record the archaeology. So here's stripping taking place in the spring of 2015 and here is a clearer plan of what we had and overall we've got a mixture of Middle, Middle Iron Age and Early Roman uh, occupation. Uh, here we've got a pit alignment and that's a typical Late Bronze Age Iron Age boundary uh, consisting of pits dug adjacent to each other. Um, these quite often turned into ditch boundaries, but in this, this instance it's left as a, as a pit alignment and hasn't, hasn't seen that modification. Um, and there are other pit features around that we've got an enclosure down here. This area down here is going to be our real area of interest. And then we've got other enclosures um, up the top here, presumably where there were buildings, um, although the traces of the buildings have been ploughed away. It's what we'd call truncated. Here's the same plan with a bit of phasing in it so you can try and tell what goes with what because it wasn't all there at the same time. There's definitely a, a progression. And we've got in pink, we've got our earliest Iron Age, which is in these the pits here. And then we've got a, a second Iron Age phase in orange with this ditch here that kind of kinks through the middle of the pit alignment. And then we've got a ditch which cuts that. So we know that that, that ditch has to be later and that's our Iron Age 3. Um, and also Iron Age 3 down here, these ditch, ditches and this pit 
and that's the important pit. Remember that one. Here's a typical pit alignment pit. Nothing too much to say about it. Um, there are uh, basic characteristics that can be um, recorded and hopefully finds material that we sometimes get from some of them. Uh, here's the northern end of the pit alignment. We've got a possible structure near to the end there, um, a four post structure some of some sort. Um, I will not, we're not going to dwell on this. And here is our detail of the phasing of where we have our pit alignment, which we think is the earliest feature. We've got our phase two, which is the ditch. You can see it wiggles here. It's got a bend in it where it's been passed through between pits of the pit alignment, um, suggesting to me that it's later than the pit alignment and then the third ditch which cuts across the top. And then in the corner, the pit alignment sweeps round uh, and we've got an enclosure below it, but we think the enclosure is Roman, not Iron Age. And here is the site under excavation. And here is a plan of that enclosure that I was just telling you about um, below the pit alignment. So we've got a, um, a complex of features. We've got this enclosure, which we think is Roman, but we've also got a surface of um, a metal surface and we've got a series of pits uh, that we think are water holes. And we've got one water hole there, we've got one water hole there, and we've got a third water hole there. And then this metal surface that we think is related certainly to the westernmost water hole. Here's a plan of one of these uh, water holes. So a deep water bearing pit effectively, perhaps for the grazing, uh, for, sorry, watering livestock, watering cattle, perhaps. And there's a, a picture of that excavated. There's another pit here, um, which has been dug through it. And down here, you can see that the fields are dark and gray and they contain waterlogged material, woody fragments, um, seeds, leaves, uh, anything uh, organic that if it gets waterlogged, it can actually survive for thousands of years as long as it stays waterlogged. And this can give us information on past environments. And here's another plan of another water hole. And you can see at the base of this one, there's actually a, a make, a, a, some stone and timbers that look to be put in to actually revet the side of the water hole and stop it collapsing in. Now um, to the um, east, uh, sorry, to the north are some more features. Uh, and here we are, here's the excavation plan showing some uh, ditches and a whole complex of pits. And you can see those in the, there you go, in the, in the crop marks, I've traced it off. So you've got this shape here, this slightly curvy shape with the drain leading away. And I think these curves here are actually showing the ends of buildings that have subsequently been ploughed away. Now, to relate this site to other sites in the vicinity, um, here's our site of interest. This is our real area of interest. And these are our other Iron Age sites. So here are the two enclosures with settlement, with roundhouses uh, that I was showing you. And then here we have the double ditch, the boundary. Um, and here we have our pit alignment. Now there's no proof of this and uh, the pit alignment here as it curves, it looks to be curving this way and the, the double ditch is also starting to curve this way. So um, the, sorry, paleoenvironmental remains from our contemporary deposits suggest that this is a predominantly middle, uh, a pastoral landscape. So it's a grazed, that livestock are important, it's a grazed landscape in both the Middle Iron Age and the Roman periods. Um, and to the south, we have another pit alignment, not very far away on the, on the Weston Brook. So our excavation area is up here. This is the plan here, the Weston Brook. And here we can see um, uh, double ditches uh, actually cutting off a, um, a meander bend in the, in the Weston Brook. So I, I wonder if these features that we're seeing, the pit alignment with its big uh, bend and turn to the west and our double ditch with its suggestion of its turn to the west are actually indicating that we've got some uh, corridor, this is livestock management um, from the 
sites that are on higher ground um, because we're coming away from the river saw going up onto higher higher ground uh, and it's all about controlled grazing and the uh, valuable um, summer pasture down on the western edge of the river saw this is speculative the information is patchy um, but it's my interpretation and here is a kind of isometric view of how those sites go together uh, orange uh, orange is uh, iron age and purple is roman and we're just going to kind of zoom out slightly this is um, using terrain data to kind of give us a, a view of the river saw looking north here's our western brook um, meander cut off here's the site that we're looking at here are our enclosure sites uh, there's then the roman city of leicester based on the a late iron age um, important settlement and here are our roman roads each side of the saw and the mansetta road going away to the the west just to give you an idea of kind of how that looks in the landscape so watering holes and a trackway our unique artifact the nw shield that i'm going to be talking to you about was deposited on the edge of a wide and deep pit so like a three meters by two meters by one and a half meters deep um, the lower fills of the pit were waterlogged with a high organic content um, although pollen preservation was poor and actually the amount of wood that we had out of the deposits was low interpreted as a watering hole for livestock the pit was recut with a deeper and wider with a deeper and wider pit in the roman period that was subsequently infilled so the iron age pit was itself recut uh, and here is the detailed plan here is our Iron Age pit with the shield deposited in it and then here we have a Roman pit which was cut through it so Roman pit and Iron Age pit and there is a section through both along this line here And there's that the section drawn showing you the roman pit with the thick black line and then the iron age pit which is which it's mostly obliterated and our shield deposited just on the edge of just in the iron age pit and just being cut slightly by the roman pit and it may well be that in fact the shield is in a recut of its own but that's debatable and there is a picture of the um, excavated section here is the shield this is mostly roman pit and this is a bit of iron age pit which hasn't been removed by the roman pit and here is adam clapton and without adam clapton uh, i wouldn't be sat here and telling this story because i don't not we wouldn't necessarily have found uh, this object um, he found it and uh, did a fantastic job excavating it so thanks adam the object was lifted on a board um, and brought back to the, a, a, a lab at ULAS. Um, very quick realisation that this was extremely fragile and needed stabilisation. The object broke into five separate chunks and each piece was photographed and speedily drawn, traced onto acetate sheets before, wrapped, before being wrapped in cling film, aluminium foil with plaster and bandages laid onto the exposed surface, all to help stabilise it. When the plaster was cured, each piece was turned over and then the adhering soil excavated away to reveal the other side, the opposing side. So here is it shortly after having been uh, lifted and you can see it's very, very thin. It's a matter of millimetres thick and then the large, the soil lumps on which it's been lifted have actually um, sheared and that's caused the bark to unfortunately shear. Uh, it was, uh, this work the consolidation work was undertaken by Heidi Addison for ULAS, working there with Rachel Small. And here are the pieces in their trays of cling film, foil and plaster bandage. And here is the um, soil that had been on the underside being removed. And it was in the process of doing this that some of the uh, amazing preservation uh, that we had uh, became apparent 
So this piece here, uh, you can actually see some discoloration on this piece. And this is in fact paint. We've got Iron Age paint. Um, you can see a line here. And this is a scored line. It's been cut into the surface and it's one of a number of lines that will become apparent. Um, and it would appear from this very, just this fragment that we've got paint here, we've got a line and then we've got no paint. It looks like the lines are actually defining where the paint is. So perhaps there's some sort of design there. And here is uh, another fragment and you can see at the top end here this is actually what was face down remember this wasn't face up because the pieces are now downside up and we've got a strange structure here and this is in fact a boss uh, for the shield and it's organic it's been made out of plant fibers of some sort there's a more of a detailed shot these are the one-to-one uh, -one tracings, uh, which were very speedily done, but formed a, a quick and accurate record of what we had. And they were very useful as we tried to piece together the results. Following a successful pilot scan, scan all the pieces were taken to the Leicester Royal Infirmary and put through the CT scanner, thanks to Claire Robinson. Wood specialist, Mike Bamforth, uh, an independent archaeologist was contracted to record and report the object and oversee the analysis by a diverse range of specialists uh, at York Archaeological Trust and the University of York. Uh, here's one of the fragments going into the CT scanner. Um, this is in uh, late August 2015. And here we can see uh, some results and there are some extra lines in here that we weren't expecting. Uh, you can see, in fact, you can see a strong line here. This is a piece of wood that was under the shield and it's not of interest, but here we've got a strong line and here also we've got a strong line. So there are other structures, fragments in here. And there's another, another piece and you can see it's mostly bark, but we also got another line running across here. We've got structures with the bark. And again, with this piece here, a line here and a line here. So it's complicated and we don't know what we've got. Between October 2015 and November 2017, reports were compiled on all aspects of the construction and the materials. Both sides of the shield were drawn by an illustrator, Chloe Watson. Uh, tests were undertaken to identify if indeed it was paint and what paint it might be. And that was done by the University of York, who identified a uh, hematite, uh, a mineral iron uh, pigment. Attempts were made to identify any glues uh, or animal skin that might have been used in the construction and the results were negative. That was the University of York and reflectance transformation imaging was also undertaken by the University of York. Um, and this provides an excellent way of allowing an object to be recorded digitally and then in uh, uh, interrogated and analysed at a later stage. Uh, all the, the uh, wood materials were identified as best as possible by the York Archaeological Trust, that was by Steve Allen. And radiocarbon dates were determined on the bark and the boss and also the sediments that the shield had been deposited in and that was done by the University of Glasgow. The shield was after analysis, it was then treated with polyethylene glycol um, and then freeze dried to preserve it. That was by the York Archaeological Trust. And then since then, further study of the boss and importantly the handle and also the bark has taken place. Dating. So two fragments from the shield, one from the bark forming the main body of the artifact and from the boss were successfully dated by radiocarbon and provided statistically consistent dates. Now this is important because it means we didn't just get Two dates, we had two dates that actually were credible with each other. Uh, a modelling of these dates allows us to estimate the construction having been, been between 395 and 345 uh, years BC at 66% uh, probability uh, or slightly wider age range, 315 to 255 uh, at 
29% uh, probability. And two samples from the deposit in which the shield was buried were also dated. These provided consistent dates and allowed us to estimate that the shield was deposited between 300 and 195 Cal BC, and that's a 95% probability. So although the probabilities are difficult to deal with, and I might have just mis mixed up my words somewhere along the lines there, but essentially it is Middle Iron Age and uh, there's no arguing with that. So which end of the Middle Iron Age it is um, can be debated, but Middle Iron Age it is. And just to uh, add to that, yes, the Iron Age lasted for about 800 years, uh, immediately preceded the Roman occupation of Britain, and it followed the Bronze Age. And here is our one of our graphs that how we show radiocarbon, and the black is showing where something is likely to have happened, uh, and the higher it is, the more likely uh, it is to have happened. So we'll move on. Here is a picture of the shield post-conservation, and this is what we know about it. The bark, we think, is of alder, willow or poplar, hazel or spindle tree. There is an alder tree. Would have been uh, common, um, and it still is common, in, in low-lying areas near rivers. The outside of the bark is the inside of the shield. That's important. So we are looking at the outside of the shield there, and it is the inside of the bark. So there's a kind of uniformity to it. We have structures inside the bark um, that aren't the same as the bark. They're a different wood, and we're calling those laths, and they're made out of apple, quince, pear, or hawthorn. The boss is made from a twisted cores, twisted fibers, which forms the core which are, uh, form a spiral, and these are stitched with a flat fibre of grass, rush, or bass fibres. Here's a picture of the boss. That was by, um, is at the British Museum. And we, very importantly, here we've got one small fragment of what we're calling edging, and it's made of split hazel, and we think it would have gone round the hold of the shield. Uh, and it's very important because it shows us how wide the shield was. So, and, and also it has a structural significance which you will be finding out about shortly. And there's a detailed picture of the one piece of edging of hazel. The paint infills what appears to be a checkerboard design formed by the scored lines. And there's some picture from the analysis of the hematite uh, with Raman analysis. And we also have a handle um, of willow roundwood that was fixed to the bark with twisted ties. Now, the handle is invisible at the moment. You can't see it because it was underneath the boss. And uh, it was almost the, uh, the Cinderella that actually, once we realized it was there, um, led to a lot of uh, good analysis. Sorry, it's going to go backwards. And there's a picture of the fragment of handle. It's half a handle, and in fact, it was visible in the excavation picture because it was on the inside of the shield, which was uppermost. Um, and you can see it's well, it's willow roundwood, and it's been shaped. The ends, the ends have actually been trimmed on both sides to give a flat surface and then notches have been cut in. You can see a notch there and a notch there. And that's where um, twisted ties bound the handle to the bark. The bark is very thin, um, perhaps originally um, six millimeters or a quarter of an inch thick, but it's a bit thicker where we have our edging. And this may be significant. That's from a CT scan trying to show you, it's not a brilliant image, but it shows this is the outside of the shield, this is the inside of the shield near the boss. So it shows you the bark is thicker here than it is near the boss. And here's a picture from the uh, Anglo-Saxon laboratory with Pen uh, Penelope Walton Rogers, who did some analysis of the boss in York. Uh, and here's her photo of the boss. Now this shows ties 
um, that actually fixed the boss to the shield. So here we've got some stitches, hopefully you can see, that would have stitched the flange of the boss, which is the flat area that goes around the outside to the bark. To the bark. There's a detail of one of those images, also by the Anglo-Saxon Laboratory. And here's a picture um, with the boss removed from the bark, showing holes in the bark through which these stitches would have passed in a running stitch, holding the boss to the bark. Penelope Walton Rogers identified on the inside of the flange of the boss a, a greyish brown substance adhering to the flange um, and she uh, interpreted this as possible remnant of an animal skin product. Um, that isn't, it isn't proven but it's a suggestion that between the boss and the bark may have been some sort of, some sort of washer of leather uh, there might have been a lining uh, inside the boss. The Reflectance Transformation Imaging by Gareth Beale uh, at the University of York. And here is a, uh, a snapshot of, the, uh, of some of the RTI data. And this is just an image and the actual RTI gives you a, a kind of three dimensional control so you can pan and zoom in and uh, look at details but it shows you some of the clarity that we got on the actual shield this is one of the fragments the boss and the body here you can see some of the scored lines um, that are preserved there's another scored line down here um, this is deformation of the shield from the round wood that it was sat over that we don't think has any significance now importantly in this picture you can actually also see um, that there's the remnants of a stitch. Um, sorry, got ahead of myself. That's one of the. That's another RTI um, from one of the other pieces. And here is an interpretation showing the scored lines, um, and the areas where we have evidence of paint on the shield. So the scored lines are in pink, and then the stipple shows where we have paint surviving, showing you that there's a strong correlation between the scoring and the paint. There's definitely a design there. And we can also see that in places there are double lines. So we've got a scored line here. We've also got a scored line here. So it's been marked at least once. It's been marked twice. Perhaps this object actually has a little history to it. Um, it was used for a period of time. The red paints in zones. Remarking of the zones. Some patterning of holes apparent. So these hatched areas where the diagonal lines are, A, B, C, D, E, um, they are actually holes that are in the body of the shield um, and they, they are of interest as well. Now the laths uh, which are showing in black, they seem to have been inserted uh, into what are called belt loops. So they're actually going through the middle of the bark and then in places they're uh, appearing uh, in belt loops. So it's like the negative of a belt where you only see a little bit of it, of, it, of it every now and again. So what do we know about Iron Age shields? Most of our information comes from complete or partly complete examples dredged from English rivers in the 19th century. And some incomplete shields have been recorded uh, through controlled excavation in what are called warrior burials. Evidence has also come from miniature shields that were placed in hordes which were intentionally deposited. The miniatures have allowed the recognition of a new type of shield uh, in the 1990s. Common through this is that our knowledge from Britain is dominated by metal. Um, we're looking at um, copper alloys and iron uh, for our knowledge of shields. Here's some of the examples. So this is the Witham shield um, from up near Lincoln. A long, tall, uh, rectangular shield with rounded ends. And here is a similar shield. You can see the spine on the Witham shield. In fact, there was another spine to an Iron Age shield and that came from closer to Leicester 
um, from uh, Ratcliffe on Saw uh, during the railway construction in the 19th century with some lovely uh, Iron Age um, uh, decoration on the uh, the boss area in the centre of the shield. And the Witham shield has this uh, animal, a boar, actually depicted on the outside, as you can see as well. So they're artistic um, pieces. And the Battersea shield um, from the River Thames, and this bronze shield uh, heavily decorated with um, enamel and um, uh, and um, and jewels, um, very ornate and uh, beautiful Iron Age decoration, and this has been the subject of much uh, study and well worthy is it of it. And also not quite so interesting uh, or de highly decorated in a much heavier shield, the Chir the, the uh, Chertsey shield also from the Thames, um, which had an ash wood handle. Now. Both the Battersea and the Chertsey Shield, we think, are also broadly middle uh, to late Iron Age. Perhaps the Battersea Shield might be a bit later and go into the late Iron Age. Um, but broadly, broadly contemporary with what we have from Enderby. Now, of, of great significance is with the Battersea Shield, this slight change in shape. You can see how it's what we'd call wasted. The middle of the shield is narrower than the top or the bottom. And from our warrior graves from Grimthorpe, um, again, uh, shield fittings showing where an organic shield uh, would have lain. And there's a reconstruction of, a, I think, a leather hide shield um, with the um, bronze uh, and glass, uh, I think, fittings that were found in the grave. Uh, here's our miniatures, um, some from uh, the East and West Midlands, this one from Ulster, Warwickshire. We've got a little miniature shield. It's only, uh, what, perhaps eight centimetres or three inches tall, um, but definitely a shield with a boss. And you can see similar to the shields that I've been showing you with some decoration uh, around the edges. And then from uh, Leicestershire, from Breeden on the Hill, the hill fort out in northwest Leicestershire, um, we've got a, a, an ovoid shield with an ovoid boss and two rivet holes, um, perhaps suggesting where a handle was. And then a mass of miniatures um, from Salisbury, Wiltshire. This is from the Salisbury Horde, uh, 24 miniature shields um, with um, ovoid um, shields and also hide-shaped shields. Um, and this, these hide-shaped shields um, enabled a um, uh, a, a shield expert instead of the British Museum to actually interpret some other remains. Here's another uh, hide shaped shield and you can see this one's actually got a checker decoration on it so that's interesting. Um, and again you can see rivets for the handle and a boss here. There's drawings of um, that shield and another hide shaped shield. Uh, this one in fact has got a handle that's on a slight angle which is of interest. And here we have some fittings from um, burials um, with these strange straight and curvy pieces. Um, and these were reinterpreted by Instead on the basis of the hide shaped shields found in the hordes as being uh, rim pieces or bindings from hide shaped shields. So in fact, we've got a, another form of shield. Uh, and they are also found, um, have been found in warrior burials. And here we've got one from um, Deal Mill Hill. Um, so we've got fittings that have been found in the grave. We haven't got anything else, but we've got the fittings and we've got a boss and we've got rivets again on an angle. And these would look to actually show the position uh, and shape of a shield. Uh, so here we've got the drawing enlarged and here we've got the actual pieces here of a shield beside the um, buried adult um, with his um, kind of crown-like um, headpiece. And then if we go, if we look further afield and we look to Europe, uh, the Gunderstrop cauldron, which you also think is um, broadly Middle Iron Age, there's some fantastic decoration on that showing uh, Iron Age warriors with long, narrow, 
shields with central bosses and we've got the health stat um, we've got a a scabbard um, which has got some fantastic detail on it there we go um, of some uh, ovoid um, sub round shields this in this case with long long bosses and then from Germany we've got the Glauberg warrior um, a sandstone statue with details of trousers armor and a wooden shield a mustachioed man wears a torque with three pendants several rings on both arms and one on the right hand and on his head he wears a hood like headdress crowned by two protrusions resembling the shape of a mistletoe leaf and there we have the Glauberg warrior being excavated um, the shield seems improbably small for the size of warrior for, for, the, for everything else um, so whether it's stylized or, or was in fact that size everything else looks you know has some reality to it so who knows and then if we look to Ireland um, we've got a hide shield of Bronze Age date from Clonbrin this is a, a round shield um, with replicas uh, made in the 1960s and more recently this is hide so it's really quite different but it's what our evidence is and from Kill Tubrid Townland we've got an older shield um, uh, this is again it's carved from one piece uh, 10 foot down in a bog probably Bronze Age on the basis of its form um, and it must have been pretty heavy And from Littleton Bog Clonora. Now we have a composite shield, planks of alder covered with leather. And leather stitching binds the edges. Oak handle is let into the body. So we've got our handle here and our boss. A semi semi hemispherical wooden boss with a leather cover. So here's our boss. So it's a wooden boss, not a basketry boss, probably Iron Age. Note the curves. So the actual the whole thing has been drawn with a slight curve um, in both planes. Denmark, the Hortspring boat. Here we got plank shields excavated in the 1920s. Um, the boats reconstructed uh, in a museum and dated to the fourth century Cal BC, so very similar to our NW Shield date, but these are planks, they're not bark. And then we've also got a shield boss more recently found from Sweden um, that's also um, solid wood and carved and lenticular, it's called. But from Thursberg Bog, we've got something a little bit more similar. We've got a, a boss shaped artifact of basketry um, although it has no flange so it's not clear that this is definitely a boss and because it was found with iron bosses it may well have in fact have been a liner that went on the inside of a shield rather than the outside for basketry um, there's not as many examples as you might think this is an example of basketry from Whitehorse Hill Dartmoor um, as part of a kiss burial and it's Bronze Age in date A brown bear pelt folded around human cremated remains, a possible belt of sash or sash of nettle fibre textile with a leather binding, a wrist or an armband, many different beads including amber and shale and possible wooden ear studs, flint tools and tin artefacts and a woven basket of lime. So the basket tree container has a flat base, a rounded body tapering to the rim and a flat coiled lid, a lime bast container made using a bundle coil technique. Both core and stitching are identified as lime bast. Uh, the bast is just is the material between uh, as below the bark and the actual wood. It's a, a fibrous material that can be processed. And from Must Farm, a fantastic site um, of Bronze Age uh, occupation, um, a stitched bark, bark platter. use of bark archaeologically um, we found from a, a Trent Valley site at Girton Grange 
Um, and here we had some pits, some Bronze Age pits, um, a hollowed log that lined a water hole, but for our purposes of more interest, a pit which had been lined with bark that was inverted. So the bark was inside out, lining a pit um, to allow water, we think, to collect in the bottom of the pit. Um, pictures courtesy of uh, Trenton Peak, thank you. Numerous bark shields from the Southern Hemisphere. So the Gweagle Shield from Captain Cook's first contact with indigenous Australians in the 18th century, um, now in the British Museum. And actually, although it's bark, uh, so it has a similarity, it's it's not green bark worked as we're gonna find out, it's, it's solid. And there's another picture of that. I think that's still available as a an item in the history of the world in a hundred objects. And other light wooden shields, uh, including bark uh, from Borneo, a 19th century war shield, composite, including bark and wood and leather. And from Glinga in the Philippines, light wooden shields. Um, with interesting um, uh, recordings um, that they were to be used to deflect missiles rather than to actually stop them, and that will become more relevant uh, as, uh, as I tell you more. And light wicker shields in use recently. So Singapore, 1964, Vietnam, 1964. So lightweight organic shields remain common. They're strong. Um, they have, they do the job that's needed. No direct parallels of finds of bark shields in the Northern Hemisphere. Studies of shields are dominated by metal. There are some examples of wooden shields and wooden bosses, and one example of what we think is a probable liner, a wicker boss liner from a Danish bog. We have the hide shield from the Bronze Age from Ireland, and we've got a leather covered wooden shield from Ireland. And plenty of examples of bark, wooden and woven shields from the Southern Hemisphere. But that's it. We've got no direct parallel for our bark and uh, basketry shield from the British Iron Age. Now, if we look to history, we've got the Greek writer Pusanias, who in the second century AD mentions the Achaeans using wicker and hide shields based on Persian prototypes. We have Caesar recording the hasty construction by the Gauls of shields made of bark or interwoven wickers which they had hastily covered over with skins. So some similarity there, um, but we've got no indication of our shield being covered with a skin and it's been decorated on the outside. So how does that work? We've got the tentative identification of a skin product between the flange and the bark. Is this a remnant of a hide cover? Or as I was saying, perhaps it's a liner. Um, the presence of the decoration on the outer surface of the Enderby shield suggests there was no hide covering. It's possible that the main body of the shield was made of layered hide and the bark layer acted as a facing to carry the decoration. But this would then be complicated by our handle. How strong would a shield just of bark be? Would it, would it be strong enough to actually work? So we began wondering, could we make a replica just from the definitely identified parts um, and have some more certainty about what we were talking? So in April 2018, we started planning for a reconstruction weekend in the June of 2018. So the handle and the start of the experiment. So this is in the School of Archaeology at the University of Leicester and with the shield has come back from York. And we have Paul Windridge, uh, a friend of mine, and Cheska Beamish uh, looking at the shield and looking at the boss. Now, Cheska Beamish had woven quite a few baskets in her time, and she um, kindly agreed to have a go at making a boss on the basis of the evidence that we have. Paul um, is a all-round craftsman uh, with interested in lots of things and very skillful. So he was great to have on board because he was also full of enthusiasm. So um, they would they had come in to have a look at the boss um, and also have a look at the laths because I was going to have a go at making laths with Paul. Here's the fragment of handle again. So, and here's the bit of withy tie that in fact held this handle 
onto the bark. And here, I've got ahead of myself before, we can see in the RTI imagery, in fact, a fragment of stitch um, that would have gone, that would have been holding the handle onto the shield from below. And here is our excavation picture um, showing the inside of the shield. So this is what's uppermost. Here's our half a handle, which had escaped my mind as to how significant it was. Um, and here we've got an area where there is no bark. Um, the bark's missing. So the shield is missing where part of the handle has broken away. So we've got half a handle, which Mike Bamford has thought has, thinks have been cut. And then we've got the bark missing where that end of the handle would have been attached. So maybe the handle's been cut in half and part of it's been ripped off um, to leave that hole. And there's a more detailed picture of our the end of our handle showing how it's been shaped on both sides and how there's a bit of withy tie sitting in the notch. Now I looked at the handle and realized that on the basis of the fact that it had been shaped on both sides with this shaped face where my cursor here is going against the bark that the bark had to be curved because it had to be curved to meet both ends of the handle on the assumption that the handle was symmetrical. So this tells us that like the Irish alder and leather shield I was telling you about and like you might imagine for a shield it wants to curve around you slightly. Here's a, an interpretation of our evidence and here are the assumptions. The boss is central. The decorative lines were vertical, intended to be vertical and horizontal. The overall shape of the shield was symmetrical. And this also means that the handle was at an angle to the decoration. So our handle is angled. And that has its parallels. If you remember before, I showed you some pictures of miniatures, one of the uh, Salisbury Shield miniatures, and also one of the hide shaped shields from uh, Mill Hill Deal, where the handle of the shield looks to be at an angle to the main axis. There we go. And this, in fact, is at a very natural angle when you want to hold a shield, it feels just right. Reconstruction and experiment. So between April and June 2018, we did work to answer a number of questions. Could we make a bark shield? How practical is it to remove bark from a tree and work it? Has the bark any strength? Could it have been used as a functional item without any additional layer of e.g. hide? Can the bark be held in a reverse curve? How do older willow and poplar barks compare? What's the purpose of the laths? How have the laths been inserted into the bark? And what's the purpose of the split hazel edging? How strong is a willow or, and bast fibre boss. So in the, at the end of the winter of 2018 we had a go at taking bark off a felled alder tree trunk and this is with the help of Mike Winterton, uh, a local farmer who was also very interested in the project and really assisted us in our work because he provided us with a place to do the work and most of the materials that we needed. And here's Paul uh, Windridge having a go trying to take the bark off a, full, a felled alder log that had been felled earlier in the year. And I can tell you that bark was not coming off. It was absolutely stuck to the stuck to the actual trunk. The only way of getting it off was to break it. But slightly later, uh, in, if we went to a, a young uh, uh, a sapling of alder and, and cut into the bark with sharp knives, we found the bark just peeled off easy peasy. So removing bark as long as you do it while the sap is rising between April and July is easy. Do it at other times and it will result in failure. Here was our test site at Willows Farm, One Lip. Um, Here is the Leicester uh, Western Distributor with the Hobby Horse, right, Hobby Horse Island. Here is the A6. Uh, and this was uh, nice for me. We were working on doing Middle Iron Age experiments and this was just a stone's throw from a Middle Iron Age site that I excavated in 1992-93 uh, with the Leicestershire Archaeological Unit. And here's the plan from that site. Um, here's a first edition ordnance survey showing where that site was and then here where our experimental site was. And you can see here it's actually in 
osier plantation. Um, so willow osier plantation was big business um, in this part of the East Midlands in the uh, really up, up until the um, mid 20th century. And in the uh, First World War, uh, up at Castle Donington was another big area here. You can see shell shells um, casings being the shell baskets being made um, by teams of uh, willow weavers. And there's another picture from Castle Donington, which I've colorized. And Dryad, a Leicestershire basketry firm, works shell casing, uh, basketry case. That's by the by. This is June, June 2018, and the team that's been put together for this experiment, mostly strangers to each other, are metering on Mike Winston's farm at One Lip for a weekend of shield making. And here we have Diedrich Pompstra, who was absolutely critical to the success of this project. Um, a wonderful person to work with, and I'm really grateful to him for everything they brought to the project. With Mike Winston and Paul Windridge, Diedrich's just flown in from the Netherlands. Um, and we are walking areas of Mike's woodland to discuss the selection of trees with Mike. Here is Diedrich and Paul looking at an alder tree and Mike Bamforth, um, the independent wood, archaeolo wood archaeologist who also worked, we work with closely, is here recording what's going on. Here's Paul and Diedrich in a bit of early team bonding, um, looking at different areas of uh, alder, an alder tree, and th then we got a ladder, and uh, Paul's actually removing here some bark off a willow. Here's Diedrich taking bark off an alder, and his hands went red as he was doing this. It was, it was, it was bled, the sap was red, it bled red. You can see there the readiness. So essentially we've cut, used sharp knives to make horizontal cuts and then slice down um, the bark. We've used a little lever just to lift up an edge of the bark and then we're pushing our hands in to take the pressure off the bark and, and prise it off the tree without breaking it. Same thing's going on here uh, with a willow poplar. So I've done the cutting and I've got my hands pushed into the bark, pushing as hard as I can. You can feel the tension. And as you pushed your hands in, you could feel the, the tension give as the bark was released from the tree. And there we go with a sheet of uh, willow bark off, uh, come off. We'd got lakes nearby, and this was on the Friday evening, and we put our bark in the water to keep it wet overnight. Um, there's a quick picture of how the willow and the poplar compared. Um, this is the poplar that you can see it's inconsistent width. It gets much thinner where you've got these deep um, dips in the outside of the bark, whereas the willow is in fact more consistent in its thickness. There's the older. The older was a different kettle of fish. Uh, it was much thicker. So here, 10 millimeters thick, and you'd got a really nice, uniform, even uniform slab of bark to work with. And then we sat down and we, we'd got our pieces of bark and we drew up some plans and decided what we were going to do. Here's the older bark. You can see the readiness on the inside. And now we're deciding what shape of shield we're going to make and we're measuring it out. Same for the poplar. And here's Paul actually taking down the, um, the worst of the cork layer, the exterior, external surface of the bark. Um, towards the middle. Do you remember how I was saying how the middle of the shield was thinner than the outside? So we've actually chosen to reduce the outer cork layer to take it off and make it more easy to work the bark. Here was me and Paul earlier in the year having a go at making hath, uh, laths out of hawthorn and we'd got some hawthorn logs that we were splitting um, and this was actually really hard work that pretty much was difficult and slow. Um, we used side axes um, to make our laths, but in the end, we actually, in the spring, we went into the local hedgerow and took out some hawthorn poles, and from those we made green laths, and it was much, much easier to work than the seasoned stuff. So it all points to green wood working, it's just so much easier um, than working seasoned material. If you want to work it, just after it's been cut down. 
and there are three laths that I then kept wet, kept them in plastic bags um, for when we were actually doing the BART working in a few weeks time. So here we, here we are with uh, Diedrich and he's looking to actually put one of our laths into the body of the willow shield and you can see he's using a knife to cut a channel in the middle of the bark. Here he is with the alder. So he's got the bark on his lap and he's carefully pushing a sharp knife into the bark to make a channel. And then into the channel he's tapping a lath that's got a rounded end and with careful tapping and moving we found that we could push our laths all the way through. And then we took hazel from the hedgerow and we split it in half with a knife. And then Diedrich ever so skillfully pierced the edge of the bark shield bodies and tied the edging on with bark string. And Paul had a brilliant idea that the edging, if it was just held on with string as the shield went under tension, um, which it was going to do as it dried, the edging actually needed fixing in place. And so we used blackthorn pins, again, just there in the hedgerows around us. Uh, we could take these, here you go, the blackthorn pin, you get, a, you get effectively get a little nail or a pin that's perhaps an inch and a quarter or 30 millimetres long. You can break it off and tap it in. And here we go, we're tapping in blackthorn pins. This isn't directly evidenced, um, it's an interpretation and it worked. And here's Paul um, fixing his split or edging onto a willow shield. We found the poplar was too variable in thickness to actually do much with and we abandoned that and we ended up with shields of alder and willow. Here you can see the lath and how it's appearing in our negative bolt loops and here's the edging that's tied on and we've cut a hole for the boss in the middle of the shield. Here's the willow, here's the alder. They're taking shape. The boss. We made bass fibres earlier in the year and here's me and Francesca. We've taken bark off a willow pole and we're taking the outer layer off the bark to leave us with the bass fibres. So Chess in her hand with a knife is holding the bast fibres and in her other hand has got the edge of the bark and that's going to be waste. This is bast fibre, you can make simple cordage with it just by twisting it up, very useful, very strong. Um, you can process it um, by boiling it up in a lye which is water with wood ash. Um, so we had a go at doing that, a fistful of ash for a pint of water and we've got about six pints boiling and then we put in our bast fibres into that and we boiled them for about 10 minutes. And you could see a chemical process took place. You got a, a, a grey orange scum formed. And then we took them out and we rinsed them off and we, we scraped off a gooey substance which had formed on the surface of the, of the fibres, rinsed them and then put them to dry. And as they dried, they went red and that's very Iron Age. They seem to love red in the Iron Age. If we find colours in the Iron Age, they'll be red there. So that fitted very nicely. Uh, and here's uh, just an example of, um, of, of what willow rods um, in an area of production would look like. So we used willow rods for our boss. Whether or not that's actually right or not is still up for grabs. Um, but this, on the basis that we use willow rods, this is what an area of willow, effectively willow coppice, where you've got year old rods ready to be harvested would look like. Here are our bass fibres and here is uh, Chess starting off on a willow boss. Doing a bit more, doing a bit more, doing a bit more, a simple core and stitching working, working from the top down. So as it gets wider, she's stitching the spiralling rod together and here's her interpretation of the stitching and there's a finished boss. He's Deirdrick with the alder shield piercing the boss with holes and then stitching the boss on in this case to the willow shield. The handle, uh, I'm having a go at a willow handle here with a draw knife and a shave horse and you could probably just do it with a knife um, and here's Paul um, stitching on a willow handle onto his willow shield. 
and we found the willow um, was soft and the ties were going to pull through it so we made some little wedges of willow and put those underneath the stitches to actually take the load off the bark and then we forced dried. We wanted to get all this job done in the weekend and Diedrich was flying back to the Netherlands on the Monday morning. So on the Sunday, we set a fire and we put our shields to dry over the top. And this is early on the Monday morning. Um, and this is the result of the drying. So these are miniature shields that have dried. Uh, and you can see we did a little experiment and we in one shield, we put laths only. So this shield here, has got only laths and this shield here has got only edging and they both deformed so the one with edging only has formed up basically trying to reform its shape to go back to being a branch shape again and the one with laths has hasn't done that but it's deformed in an uncontrolled way so we've got a, an irregular curve so that suggests to us that the combination of laths and rim or edging actually combine to control the deformation of the shield as it dries. Edging and laths are fundamental to preventing the deformation of the bark. They stiffen parts of the object to control the resulting shape. We do not fully understand the location of the laths or how they were inserted on an angle to the grain. We put our laths in straight across the grain and that was possible. Decoration. Here's Mike here doing a mock-up for our decoration. Diedrich's mixing up a paint with some uh, hematite that he'd brought along. And here we are scoring in a design. We actually did some scraping. The older shield got a little bit overheated and a little bit charred. Um, so we actually used that to our advantage and we scraped off some of the dark material to actually get a, a light checker shape as well. And then we painted some of the squares with our red paint. This is a plan showing how all the products that we made could have been gleaned from our local campsite and the shields could have been made in a couple of days. So our campsite, we've got hawthorn from the hedge, we've got blackthorn from a bit of woodland there, we've got stands of alder and willow, we've got coppiced hazel on the edge of the wood. Um, it's just there and we made the shields. Here are our dried shields, willow on the right, alder on the left. The alder looks a bit weird because it's curved so much um, and it's also cracked a little bit, probably being through being a bit overheated uh, by me, sorry. And both shields curved as they dried. This was due to differential shrinkage of materials. Green wood materials will shrink across the grain but not along it. Therefore where cross grain and inline grain materials are joined, a tension will be created. Additionally, the bark is trying to reform its natural shape, the op opposite of what is forced by the shield construction. The figure of eight, or wasted shape, is reminiscent of metal shields, examples from, exa e.g. E from Battersea, do you remember? And here from the other side, here you can see that lovely um, curved shape, a little bit also with our willow shield and our handles. There's the Battersea shield. Now, while we were there making our shields, Mike Bamforth brought along his longbow and we had a go firing at some arrows at a test shield from only metres away. Rachel Crennan from the School of Archaeology, um, a Bronze Age weapons expert, came along to uh, join the party and uh, with us we were absolutely amazed when the arrows actually bounced off the shield. We were amazed to discover that the arrows bounced off the shield where they hit the body and only penetrated partially if they hit a lath, i.e. where it was less elastic. Arrows fired at green bark passed straight through. So in the process of drying and being put under tension, this bark was transformed. Now, evidence of um, damage to leather and metal shields has been done by looking at um, damage from metal um, spearheads. And here you can see the kind of evidence that's been found. Um, Rachel looked at the holes that we had in the bark shield and you can see the shields, the, the holes aren't quite the same. Um, we also did some work with some 3D printing by um, Dr. Mike Biggs uh, at the uh, Leicester Royal Infirmary who did some 3D prints of from the CT scans of our shapes and Rachel looked at this evidence and she found evidence of um, 
elliptical holes, possibly from a spear, and also groups of parallel incisions, um, i.e. that looked to be where a blade had hit the shield and then bounced and hit it again. And this is something that you'll commonly find um, with this sort of, um, with, with shields and blades. And she um, interprets this as being uh, damage from an edged blade, i.e. a sword, spear or knife. Now, most of our evidence, um, we don't get much evidence of metal spearheads in the Iron Age, and there isn't much evidence, but where we do get evidence, we get some evidence suggesting that spearheads might have actually been made from mammal bones, um, from tibia, from sheep or cows. And here we've got a drawing of a, a bone point that might have been a, from a spear. Um, and we need to do some more experiments here. Here's a drawing of a how a spearhead's been made from a uh, tibia, I think, and here's a photograph. Um, and we wonder, or I wonder, if these holes here might have actually been made by bone spears. But we need to do some experimental work to do that. We had got plans for that this year, but that was all put on hold by you know what. Here's another strange shape. Here's the final drawing by Chloe Watson, a lovely drawing of the shield with all our information in it. Here's just some other examples of shields that you've already seen at the same scale. And here's the end of his shield. Now, towards the end of this story, um, uh, the British Museum came to Leicester. Uh, Jill Cook, Keeper, the Department of Britain and Euro Europe and Prehistory came, and Julia Farley, Curator of the British and European Iron Age Collections, and Conservators Tanya DeLogue and Barbara Wills uh, joined us with Rachel Krellin, and we discussed the Enderby Shield. Um, following several meetings in Leicester and much discussion, Everards, the Brewers, decided to donate, donate the shield to the British Museum due to its national significance and the ongoing care it will require. The shield is now in London and currently undergoing further analysis and work led by Barbara Wills and Julia Farley to prepare it for display with its metal siblings. Some further detail on the construction of the boss will be established and with this we can publish our results. Uh, here's a photo following further cleaning by Barbara Wills at the British Museum. Um, just to buy the by, but Barbara found a thorn. I don't know if you can see it, but here there's actually the head of a thorn sticking out of our sticking out of our boss. Might be a thorn of black thorn, who knows? And here's a micro results of micro CT scan at the British Museum, showing more of the structure, and most importantly here, scan results suggesting that the core of the boss is actually made of might be made of twisted strands rather than one rather than a single willow rod you can perhaps see in here it looks like there's a composite and this is a, a flat image it's 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 very thin what's being shown here almost at the end what tree did the bark come from older the evidence for shields while well, the bronze age shields from clorna clora annandale and clinlara ireland were of older the Iron Age shields from the Hot Spring boat were alder or lime. A study of Anglo-Saxon shield boards uh, in the early 90s identified willow and alder as the most common woods to have been used. Alder has a low density making it light and it doesn't split easily. From a book of a trees, book of trees um, with a lovely pollarded alder there, um, we have this. When first cut, alder wood turns reddish orange, although the colour soon fades. In Ireland, the wood was traditionally used for making shields. No references, unfortunately. Its colour being interpreted to mean older was the tree of war. Where's that from? The wood is light and soft but resilient and historically was used for clogs. Uh, and it's got excellent below water capabilities. So uh, hints there. Why Why is it? What? What's the association with war and shields? Well, I think this is where this comes from. Um, the late 14th century book of Ballymote. A collection of prose and verse, descriptions of ages of the world, genealogies of clans and kings, geographies, translations of Glasgow and Greek and Latin texts, and it includes the Ogham alphabet, an ancient alphabet, donated to the Royal Irish Academy in 1887. A frontispiece. I'm not expecting you to read that, but the third letter of the Ogham alphabet is Fern, the older tree. Fern, shield of warrior bands, i.e. shield for fern, with him owing to their redness in the same respect, or because of the older, the material of the shield, 
was from fern given to the Ogham letter, which has taken a name from it, i.e. shield, that is fern, with him. So a strong association there between alder and shields. And from the book of Taliesin, um, the, uh, from Dalgetli, the, uh, the, the, um, the, the, the boar of the trees from the 14th century, collected by the antiquarian Robert Vaughan in the 17th century. The Cadgachau, the battle of the trees. The Cadgachau is the poem set during a war between a king and a ploughman over the theft of a deer, a puppy and a lapwing. Central to the poem is the magician Gwydion's use of a staff of enchantment to transform trees into fighting men. Sure hoofed my spurred horse on your shield, Alder Spriggs, Bran is your name, Bran of the branches. Alder, front of the line, front of the line, formed a vanguard. That gives you more associations of Alder and shields um, from a historic context. A unique and exciting object, probably commonplace in the Iron Age, but circumstances of preservation and recovery extremely rare, clearly amplifies how our knowledge is so biased by the survival of metal, easily constructed from woodland products in a short time period, that bark has much more strength and resistance than might be guessed at. We've demonstrated that laths can be fitted within the bark to stop it distorting as it dries, a lost technology. More controlled tests need to be carried out to produce clearer information. The object will attract much attention and hopefully be enjoyed by many people in the years to come and it will add significant information to understanding of Iron Age objects and the study of shields. We can offer interpretation for the wasted shape of the Battersea shield. The story continues. What happened to the trees? Well, in the winter of 2019, this is how the old tree looked. And that's the willow. So they both started regrowing. The trees are alive and growing fine, and they're starting to grow over. There's the stand of alder. Hopefully you can see the alder tree in the middle. There it is, with the negative shield shape clearly showing. Now, this has parallels. Um, from photographs of making bark shields in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, Aborigine, um, we have this. The clear negative shape left creates an Aboriginal scarred tree. And these scars are actually highly decorated and become things in their own right, the Aborigine scarred trees. The bark uh, by the Aborigines is used for containers, shelters and shields. Some of the scars are then decorated and become venerated. And from a, a manual in New South Wales, we've got the Aboriginal scarred trees. Uh, and this shows here in New South Wales the distribution of scarred trees, um, obviously prior to the terrible fires of last year. Um, but scarred trees are quite a thing for the Aborigines. And what might this mean for Iron Age Britain and Iron Age Europe? We've got a whole load of evidence um, of indications that bark was perhaps used more widely than we might have thought, and what's happened to the trees where they took the bark from. A big thank you to Adam Clapton, Mike Bamforth, Cheska Beamish, Rachel Krellin, Julia Farley, Mike Winston, Paul Windridge, and Dietrich Pomstra. And also thanks to all those people on there and all the other organisations involved.